All right. Welcome everyone to the SEI webinar series. My name is Suzanne Miller. Today I'll be your host for a webinar with my colleagues and friends, Janine Sivy and John Wood, to talk about the value of systems engineering within software context, and a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm gonna go ahead and we'll get started. A couple things before we get started. One, we will have questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, so if you ha have questions during the uh, seminar, if you would put them there, please, we'll address those at the end, unless we have uh, particular uh, clarifying questions that we need to address right away. Um, so we appreciate your patience with that. Please make sure that you're on mute. I think we are muting all um, as, a, as a practice, but it's always good to have your own uh, mute button on so that we don't have distracting background noise. So with that, I'm gonna go and turn it over to Janine Sivy to introduce herself and John Wood, and then we'll get started with the seminar. Janine? Thanks, Suze. It's so great to be working with you again. Um, hi, I'm Janine Sivy. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself and let John and Suze introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Um, I currently work in with small and medium healthcare organizations, catalyzing and roadmapping their paths to sustainable growth spanning optimization, innovation, and full reinvention. So I do this via mission-aligned and unified business strategy and product and service portfolios with heavy focus on all things digital and data, including automation and responsible AI. Whether we're designing or refining or rebalancing or pivoting, helping organizations see and leverage their unified, defragmented, cohesive system is crucial to their success from their enterprise ecosystem to their products and services to their internal processes and infrastructure. I've been doing this in healthcare for about 12 years, payer, provider, EHR platforms, business, digital systems, uh, and also analytics from dashboards to responsible AI and machine learning models released out to market. Prior to that, I worked at the SCI. I worked for Paul Nielsen, uh, crafting business innovation and investment initiatives. And before that, I worked for Dave Zubro in the measurement and analysis program. So hey out there to anybody in the audience who I worked with before. Before that, I worked for Kodak as for 12 years as a control systems engineer and then a lead engineering manager and lead global reliability um, team lead. Um, over to you, John, for introductions. Thank you. I am John Wood. i federal employee. I work for the, the Navy out here on the West Coast. I'm in San Diego. I'm a lead systems engineer for our department. So we have about 850 engineers supporting 120 projects, the majority of which uh, we classify as software intensive. So that what, what that means is at least 50% or more of the development costs are going towards software. The life cycles of those are quite a big range. So we have early stage R&D. We're also supporting products that have been fielded for decades. Prior to that, uh, I also worked in healthcare. So I had similar, similar roles as Janine, a little bit more focus on analytics for my sweet spot. Uh, but that was a fun time. Also, during that time, founded a charity and also a consulting business. So I got to live under true resource constraints, which which are what we built in the Fire Sky story we're going to share with you in a little bit. And I'm Suzanne Miller. Um, I'm a principal researcher here at the Software Engineering Institute. My very first job in 1993 when I joined was uh, as project manager for the systems engineering capability maturity model. So I've been involved with systems engineering and software working together for many, many years. So this is one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to do this webinar with Janine and John, because this is, as I said, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So let's go ahead and get started. Janine, why don't you kick off the story about FireSky and, and tell us all about it. Yeah, great. So to set it up a little bit, um, I'd like to also introduce our working group. So John and I are representing the Systems and Software Interfaces Working Group of INCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering. That's who we're, we're representing today. And back in the early days of INCOSI, they spent a lot of time on the value of systems engineering and relationships with project management. Um, and as you all know, software was becoming increasingly pervasive. And one of the things that happened was that our corporate advisory board, which consists of over 100 member organizations from over 38 countries, they cited systems software interfaces as one of the top six needs. 
in this working group was born in 2017 to confront and close those interface gaps um, and basically find our way in the digital world. But we all know that the world doesn't stand still and that catchphrase, everything is software, has given way to everything is data. And the word tech connotes software and IT in the circles I travel, not all of the other technologies that are out there. And digital transformation is a C-suite conversation. So I think we can all agree that digital and data intensity is here. And there have been great strides, both in methodologies and professional disciplines. So agile, DevOps, ML ops, the human-centered design discipline, all great things. But challenges remain. Um, there are complex problems still that we face. Some of them are wicked problems. And we could toss around some statistics about the percentage of digital transformations or software projects that succeed or fail. But what I'd like to share are a couple statistics about the overall system. So based on recent studies, just, uh, just under half, about 44% of projects have been noted as failing or having significant issues due to lack of alignment between business and project. And the financial implications are astounding. This has cost in the United States alone over $260 billion, not even including the cost of producing digital products and services that are not actually relevant in market. So we in systems engineering see ourselves as a contributor to addressing challenges like this and to achieving success in today's era. However, we also observe that a lot of data and software intensive organizations don't know very much about systems engineering or they see it as too onerous for the value delivered. So in our working group, we see two things as really critical to our success in addressing systems and software interfaces. One of them is to get really clear on the value we add. And the second is to not only embrace the interface we have with software professionals, but also with the other disciplines around us. So about a year ago in our working group, we created an ebook with five stories of business relevance, Aero, Auto, Healthcare, e-commerce, and startups. What we're going to tell you today is, our, is about our next endeavor, where we set out to focus on how do software and systems professionals interact in today's team environments, um, and with attention to product professionals. To do that, we created a fictional organization called FireSky, and we wrapped a story around it. John's going to tell that story about how an organization faced a daunting challenge and they rose to the occasion. They embraced it and some things went well, some things not so much. And then he's going to tell a refactored story with one well-matched systems engineer who partners effectively with both the product and the software professionals on the team. So in between the before and after, I'll pipe in with a little bit of explanation about the causal system. So, John, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thanks, Janine. Um, as Janine talked about our working group, we were talking about different role relations, and we had a virtual room like this on Zoom, room full of systems engineers, and we said, well, who's responsible for this, and who's responsible for that? And the, the answer was always, well, it depends. It depends. And so that, that got a little old, got a little frustrating. So what we did is we created a, a realistic but fictional story about uh, firefighting helicopters like the one you see on the right and this company called FireSky who creates software that supports the maintenance of these helicopters. So that's the journey we're going to take you down. So uh, another thing we did to make things a little bit clearer is we use terms that we pulled out of the Scaled Agile. So if you know that the SAFE framework, um, they've got clear terms and roles and responsibilities built in for each of those terms. So those are the, the terms we use as we created this scenario. So in our fictional company, FireSky, there is one product manager. He reports to the business owner. And that product manager also oversees three different scrum teams. Each team has a product owner, a scrum master, and about three developers. And their, their responsibilities vary. So team one, they work on aircraft diagnostics. So that's plugging a laptop into that helicopter and figuring out what's working well and what's not working well. So that's your diagnostics that's running on a ruggedized laptop at the airfield. 
Then you have a dynamic repair manual. You, you found out something's wrong, you want to fix it. So the, the mechanics, they use this repair manual to figure out which compartments they need to open, what's the right order, what's the torque specs on different bolts. That's what team two is responsible for. Finally, team three, uh, they're running a server that has the maintenance status information. So it's got the full maintenance history of the aircraft as well as the current status. And that goes live in the emergency operations center. So um, out here on the West Coast, one of the things we deal with are wildfires. So we have operation centers and fire control centers that are working to put out those fires. And they need to know which helicopters are active, if they're fully capable or partial capable. If they're partial capable, well, maybe they can't do night operations, but they can do day operations. So we'll use this helicopter now, and then later on we'll use this other helicopter. So that, that's a scenario we built out. Uh, the software has been fielded for about eight years. It's running well. There's 10 operational sites, uh, but now there's a new change. So the, the normal changes were cybersecurity updates to the software, or perhaps uh, a new piece of equipment is added to the helicopter. So there's some small modifications. Today, the scenario we're facing is the operating system for that server is going out of date. And in conjunction, they're gonna need a new uh, hardware suite for the server. But as the team discusses this, they realize it's going to be a lot easier and better in the long term if they also update the operating systems that run on those ruggedized laptops. That's a, that allows the teams to take advantage of newer protocols. Uh, the downside there is they're going to have to refactor the entire product suite and about a third of the laptops will need hardware upgrades as well. So with that intro, if you go to the next slide, Janine. So one of the, the tools we were using early on in our working group is, is social network analysis. Uh, we were having fun, again, a, a Zoom room full of systems engineers geeking out on all the connections and information flows. Uh, but Janine was good. She pulled us away and reminded us, hey, who's our main audience here? It's not other systems engineers. It's the, the software arena. So we try to figure out how to convey our story and what is most important to people involved in software. And so we, we came up with a diagram structure you see on the left. We're depicting fire sky. Uh, the solid lines are kind of the normal day-to-day -day interactions. The dotted lines are some of the new things that are brought up because of the, the change in the environment, the, the new change. We talked about that operating system. A key factor here is the bubble size. So as the bubbles grow, that means the workload for that person or team also grows. So as we said, we've got this challenge before the Fire Sky team. Immediately, two heroes emerge, and that's the product manager and the development lead out of Team One. They realize this isn't business as usual. This is a significant change. So they collaborate together. They figure things out. They start focusing on the interfaces. They know those are going to be a challenge. So they, they define the interfaces. They define which of the three teams are responsible for which aspects of the interfaces. Uh, they start thinking ahead, planning, they, they align their ticketing system to those interfaces as well as the normal workload. And they think they're set up. They're ready to do business as usual with their uh, established ticketing system. Next slide, please. So that's working well. Our, our two heroes, product manager and the lead developer, they're, they're being good leaders. They're showing the way. Um, but then they start testing the software, the team as a whole and they notice some challenges. So especially when they hit that first integration test, uh, they notice software is not behaving quite the way they wanted. Um, but worse, they, they noticed that with the test that they had set up, they were able to determine the software wasn't working, but the test plans weren't detailed enough to figure out what was wrong. So they would issue tickets, but often they went to the wrong team, or they maybe they went to the right team, but that team thought it was the other team. So there was Shuffling of tickets, a little bit of confusion going on. Uh, next slide, please. So now the, the testing failures start to increase. So there, there were the, the developers figured out, hey, we got to focus on testing. They revamped their test plans, made them more detailed. That was successful, but it also created more bugs, more tickets. And so they were issuing these tickets to the teams. Uh, now they knew they were able to figure out who they should go to the first time, so that was helpful. Um, but they also realized as they were testing 
with three different software versions, they had to lock those down. Um, there was too many moving parts if they let all the teams operate independently. And so at this point in the story, the testers are really driving the show or at least driving the schedule. They're saying, hey, we've got to have the software locked in on this date. Um, frustrated the developers a little bit because now they're idle, but the developers understood the reason for it. So they would do this testing, make their improvements, but the calendar days kept flipping by and eventually they needed to field. Uh, so the product owner had worked out schedules with the external sites. Remember we have 10 of those emergency operations centers and corresponding airfields. And it's a big deal for those operation centers to pause. So of course they need a pause when the new hardware is coming in and software is getting installed. But to do that, they have to transfer the responsibility over to another site. So they're shifting workers, they're changing schedules, they're defining areas of responsibility. So those things could not slip. So software, as good as it was, went out to the site, first site, and there were some challenges. So the, the software team, they, they lost some of their players to go do that install. People doing the install ran into challenges, some they could fix, some they had to call back to get help on. And, and if you pause for a minute and put yourself in the, the software developer's shoes, you think about their typical normal business of just doing those cyber updates and uh, occasional changes to the helicopter. These developers were employed full time. They were earning their salaries. But now for the last six, seven months, they've almost been doing twice the workload because they're doing their normal job and they're also developing the new version of the software. Now on top of that, they're losing team members to support the operational sites and they're getting the, their ticketing systems backing up because there's more and more challenges discovered. And then once they hit the second site, it just explodes. It gets even bigger, even more challenges. So at this point, the, the product manager is getting phone calls from the operational site saying they're not quite happy with the way things are going. Um, back in the office, people aren't very happy. They're overworked, they're tired. They're overwhelmed with their ticketing system. They're getting a little cranky, if you know what I mean. Maybe some finger pointing. And then probably the worst thing that could happen, that business owner is getting phone calls now. So the sites are so unhappy. They're no longer working with the product manager. They're calling that business owner and saying things have to change. So the team is realizing their company's reputation as well as future profitability are at stake. Janine, I think it's your turn now. So give, give a little recap. So before we, yeah, before we tell the refactored story with a systems engineer involved, um, let, let's continue what this team does. So they eventually make it to the end of the project. So missed deadlines and all of the issues that John mentioned. And like a good team would do, they do a retrospective. Um, so they definitely identify some pain points. So they're direct pain was ticketing overload and capacity management that caused issues with deadlines. If we unpack that a layer, you know, why did that happen? Well, there were interoperability and integration failures. And they also acknowledged there were some leading indicators that that was going to happen. The, the folks who were doing the testing were raising their hands early saying, hmm, we've got some issues. There are some failures here in integration that we're not expecting, and maybe our integration test plan isn't as comprehensive as it needs to be. And John also mentioned some of the challenges around, you know, who do we allocate these tickets to? So these are all leading indicators of the problems that eventually occurred. However, the momentum of the business as usual ticketing flow, the uh, the momentum of how work normally happens kind of carried the day. Um, the next layer of the causal system is, you know, really getting to root cause, right? So, so far it's the direct pain points, the, the direct causes, the leading indicators. And in their retrospective, the team acknowledges, because hindsight is twenty twenty, that way back in the planning, when you know, everybody really stepped up and acknowledged this was bigger than usual. In reality, they caught about 30 to 40 percent of the interfaces that they really eventually had to address. Um, so now if we add an extra lens, so we're going to add our systems engineering lens onto this and we can unpack that further and say, well, there were systems, architecture documents, interface documents, 
functional spec documents that were not updated or created as the case may be. And the situation was exacerbated because the original documentation from way back when, when the product was first created, it was created once and never kept up to date. So the original creators of all this software have moved on long ago and the software sat or the documentation sat there never being updated. So this team was faced with a daunting challenge with old out of date documentation and doing the best they, they could. They caught about 30 to 40 percent of what they needed to catch from an interface standpoint. So I'm going to pass the mic back to John, and he's going to tell a refactored story with just one systems engineer. So we limit our, limited ourselves. We didn't build out a whole systems engineering department. We said we could add one, and John's going to explain why. Thanks, Janine. Uh, so as Janine said, we were able to add one systems engineer. So we're, we're going to rewind the script here and... Think about the, the Fire Sky team. They've got this challenge ahead. Same two heroes emerge. So that product manager and that lead developer out of team one, they're looking at what's going on and they realize this is not business as usual. These are some complex changes. There are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of different timetables and schedules that have to be kept. A lot of interactions with the external customers, uh, the operational sites. And so what they do is they take the case to the business owner and they tell them, hey, this is a big deal. This is not business as usual. We're going to need help. So the three of them talk and they decide that they're going to bring on a systems engineer. So that systems engineer gets hired, joins the team, learns about Fire Sky, gets the new polo shirt with the Fire Sky emblem on it. Uh, he, he shows up and he's tied at the hips with both that product manager and the lead developer. So they're still the heroes in this story. They've been there the longest. They know what's going on. Uh, but they're bouncing ideas off the systems engineer. They're liking what they hear and they start implementing certain things. So similar to before, they, they, they know those interfaces are gonna be a challenge. So the systems engineer starts with system architecture. Uh, hopefully they can find some of the old ones. If not, he's recreating them. Those get allocated to, to software architectures or figuring out which teams are responsible for which, very similar to before. Uh, but one thing that comes naturally for systems engineers is they, they take requirements all the way through to the test cases. So immediately that systems engineer is looking at what are the test cases that can prove a certain functionality works or doesn't work. And so already the, those test plans are getting refined, they're, they're getting improved. Um, back to the, the bubble size, you can see the, the product manager and the team lead, lead, those are big bubbles and systems engineer, big bubbles. Um, they're, they're doing this kind of behind the scenes, letting the software developers operate as much as they can as normal. Another thing the systems engineer is doing is looking at potential friction points between those three software teams. So he's identifying those and he's trying to figure out how to mitigate those. And one of those things he does is clearly defined roles, uh, boundaries for each of those teams and checkpoints. Hey, if you come into this situation, here's who you should talk to, here's who you need to alert. So by putting those rules in place, they're able to act as a team of teams. So get some independence back to those individual scrum teams that they didn't have in our pre previous scenario. And then the last thing that systems engineer is doing is he's thinking ahead and he's working out to the external sites. He's making sure that the logistics are in place so that those sites can receive the hardware. He's figuring out if they have room to set up two parallel suites for concurrent operations so they can have the, the new suite of hardware and software running alongside the old suite, uh, just in case there's any problems. Uh, he's also making sure there, there's training that happens. And so there, the project's unfolding. Things are going well. People are staying proactive. Um, but at this point, the bubbles shrink a little bit so that that product manager, the lead developer, and even the systems engineers, their, their bubbles shrink a little bit. But the key thing here, especially for our two heroes, that product manager and that lead developer, they get to go back to their sweet spot. So as Janine has said previously, not in this call, but in others, I really liked her phrasing here, they get to unleash their superpowers. So these two people are really good at what they do, and now they can focus on that. They and the teams can focus on software development because the external challenges and logistics are being handled um, by the systems engineer in conjunction with that product manager and the, the lead developer. Uh, next slide. So things are going well, 
they feel the software. And of course there's challenges along the way, but the, the key here is we call them the triad. So that product manager, the lead developer and the systems engineer, they're working together, they're minimizing risk and making sure the most critical things meet the timelines. And so back to you, Janine. Okay, so that is the end of our refactored story. Um, Suze, were you going to make a comment here, or do you want me to uh, go right into our decision guidance? Yeah, the, the only comment I was going to make, and this is for the software teams that are represented in our audience, a lot of uh, recent talk has been about something called team topologies and about the um, uh, idea of how do we take teams like this that have challenges and formulate them in a way that uh, gives us the best advantage. And the, the thing that I noted when we first started talking about FireSky is one of the things that is happening in this scenario is an increase in the cognitive load. In other words, what does it take to actually do the work is changing. And sometimes that also means that we need to think about how the teams are, are oriented. And so the idea of the systems engineer helping the these uh, teams with, with roles uh, and boundaries is one of the ways that you help understand and help help deal with that cognitive load so that we're trying to segregate sort of the, so that not everything, everyone is having to think about everything. Now that may mean that in a future scenario, you might even have another refactoring, right? The working group could do this too, of thinking about that particular issue. How would we refactor the teams, not just by adding the systems engineer, but how would we refactor that so we have better communication paths among them? But um, that's that's you know kind of getting into future work. I love to to give Janine more work, um, you know, future work for the teams. But just want to make that comment because that is uh, something that we're talking a lot about in the uh, software arena. Um, and there is a question in here that you may want to we may want to talk about right now. Is the systems engineer performing a business analyst role as well as a systems engineering role? And so I'll I'll let Janine and, and John take that question if you're ready to take that now. Yeah, John, why don't you go, that's a great question. Um, it you know starts getting into different kinds of requirements. So John, why don't you fill that? And then I'll talk about our decision guidance and we'll keep going. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we talked about uh, as we were building a scenario is what type of systems engineer would be most applicable here. And uh, business al analysts, th those are great, but I, I don't see them um, in this role as much. If we had more money and we could hire a systems engineering department, I think they would take on more of that business analyst role, but this is an established company. They, they've got their uh, business strategy in place. They, they've got their, their cash flow understood. They've got their customers understood. So not so much in this case, but it is a great question. And, and I think that the way you've talked about the story and what I've sort of read of it, I think in this scenario, the business owner is really been the one that's been acting in that business analyst role. They've been uh, funneling the the requirements and prioritizations to the product manager uh, over time. So I think that that works, you know, that that seems to be what was working for them. And the systems engineer is really acting as an interpreter of those requirements uh, for the rest of the teams. So, all right. Yeah. And uh, what I'll add is um, it, this is this exemplifies why we went scenario based as well. Right. So every scenario is a little bit different. If we were picking this kind of idea up and telling the story, say, in a healthcare digital disruption scenario, the answers to these questions and the role, the details of the roles might be a little bit different, but some of the underlying fundamental questions are the same. So let me share uh, our decision guidance and then we'll open it up to other questions and discussion. So. We've created, so as a working group, part of our mission is to create tangibles, things that people can use day to day to address their situation. In our case, you know, we're hoping folks can leverage the talents that we bring to the table. So we, we created a general causal pattern for this scenario, and I'm not going to show you that today, but I'm going to hit you with a punchline of that causal system, which is the software team went through a journey of unknown unknowns. And they did a really good job. I mean, they they rose to the occasion at the beginning to address all these interfaces that were you know new and different for them. Um, but still, it was a journey of unknown unknowns. And in our causal system archetype, if you will, we show how that 
Those unknown unknowns translate to business implications and where are the leverage points to really reduce the unknowns. And from there, we created a starter decision guide for how do you know when you're in this situation, that you're starting a journey of unknown unknowns and that you really need some other kind of expertise to join the team. And we challenged ourselves to not use jargon. So as John said before, you know, we spent a little bit of time geeking out in our system space, drawing pictures and using all of our jargon. But then, you know, just like any discipline, we de-jargonized it. So anytime, you know, any discipline is creating something for another discipline, you, you got to weed that jar jargon out. So our decision guide really focuses on, are there more changes than usual in scope, clarity, size, and complexity? One chunk. Decision participation, another chunk, and then workload and ticket management or anticipated workload and ticket management as another chunk. And I'm just going to highlight a few things here. So for scope, clarity, size, and complexity, we want to look at things like the quantity of interfaces touched and tested. Does it seem like more than usual? Um, that can be a little tricky to answer that, right? We only know what we know. Um, but another one that might be uh, more telling is the degree of varying and mismatched timetables across teams. So once the teams start looking at all the things they need to do and how they need to be synchronized and the hard deadlines that need to be coordinated, that might make it more apparent that what, what lies ahead is more challenging than might be realized. Um, also, the level of functional interdependence um, that needs to be updated or created. So do we actually know what this system is about? Is it clear? Was the documentation 10 years old? And so on and so forth. On decision participation, um, are, are we looking at more participation than usual, usual from the business owner, from the business strategists, from hardware engineers, from field personnel? So is it significantly different than usual. And again, going back to this idea of managing timetables. So if if I'm on one team and we're doing X, Y, Z, do we have to call upon another team to participate in our decision-making in, in order to ensure everything will work? And then last for workload and ticket management. And this one can be really tricky because it's anticipated workload and ticket management. Again, we don't always know what we don't know. But a, a really big tell is whether or not it's hard to figure out what team a ticket should be assigned to because it's really at the interface. So should it go there or there or both? Um, that's a really big tell that, that we need a system uh, perspective on this. Um, also, again, more cross-team coordination. And then hats off to, to John for this one. Uh, how much training is going to be required for the end user? So is this an update to training, an FAQ page, or do we need full-on clean slate training? That can be a really big tell that something is much bigger than usual. So we offer our guidance out there. Um, we are hoping that among the audience that this has been useful at face value, but we're also hoping that some of you might be interested in collaborating with us to try this guidance out, to help us create more and more diverse scenarios and storylines. And then if you have an inner systems voice and would like to participate with us on our causal system diagram and maybe some simulations, we would love that kind of participation as well. So I'll just say before we open it up to questions, um, and you'll get this in the deck that's distributed as well, um, you can just contact us Contact us at this uh, email address. It's our working group email. Uh, John and I also have our personal emails in the reference that references that will be sent with the deck. Um, so I think at this point, we'll open it up to other questions. So Suze? All right. So while uh, we're waiting for some other questions, I've, I've got a couple that, that sort of came to mind as I was I was listening to this. One is for people in the audience that are software engineers that might be in that lead developer role, uh, for example, or the product manager role, even what what are if, you know, what are the kinds of skills that they would want to build if they want to actually move into more of a systems engineering role? What are the differences between the skill set of a lead developer, as an example, and a systems engineer? Um, I'm not sure who wants to take that, but I'll open it up to both of you. I'll go ahead. So I, the, the scope is different, and the, the difference behind that is the timeline. So systems engineers tend to look at the, the full 
product development life cycle all the way through to retirement. Whereas the, the software teams are usually focused on the product development and, and some of the upkeep of it as well. Right. But it's just that broader view. And so every decision you're making, even if you're in the development timeframe, you're thinking about how is that gonna impact maybe the training, maybe the, the future sustainment of that product, those types of things. And another yeah, and Andre, oh, go ahead. Okay. I see, I, I would re reinforce or underscore that impact analysis aspect. So for everything we do, what is what upstream might be impacting that piece of sure. work and what is the downstream impact? And uh, you know, several years ago when I was working with some very large software implementations in healthcare, that was one of the biggest challenges. You know, the software teams would work and they produce amazing software, but the, the systems were so complex that it was very, very difficult to see how one piece of release software would play out. You know, so, so say in a, a, a healthcare membership platform, how is that going to play out in the claims system mm -hmm. 18 months later? So impact analysis and the ability to trace that through is it's a skill that's really important. Yeah, the, the skills, the other skills that I, you know, sort of when I was educated in this area that really came out are, are the C skills, right? I call them the C skills, collaboration, communication and conflict resolution. And that last one in particular, whether it's impact analysis or stakeholder management, that's one of the skills that I see uh, if you want to become a systems engineer and you you come out of a different discipline, whether it's software or elsewhere, you know, getting yourself familiar with and comfortable with that collaboration and conflict resolution aspect is one of the things that that I always found to be the most useful systems engineers that I know are ones that are very good in those areas. I I, I think I'm seeing head nods, so I'm guessing you guys agree with that. All right. Um, second, go ahead. Did you want to say something, John? Oh, nope. just agreeing with you. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Complete agreement. All right. Um, and we do have a couple of uh, people that are interested in contributing, so that's good. But I also have a question from uh, the audience. What steps are recommended when systems engineer is not a recognized role within the organization, but you still need it? So, you know, you have scrum masters, et cetera, et cetera. But the SEI, the systems engineering processes are not uh, visible or they're dismissed out of hand. How do you proceed in that kind of a setting? Yeah, I think John and I can both talk about that. So um, other than when I worked for Kodak and was a control systems engineer, very specific kind of systems engineer, I've never had a systems engineering title. Um, yet I function as a systems engineer. So I consider myself kind of stealth. Um, a couple of jobs ago, I had what was called a, a solutioning role. And that was the closest I ever came to an official title that kind of gave agency to this type of systems thinking. Um, so, you know, what steps are recommended to answer the question directly? One is that no matter what role you have, you know, integrate systems capabilities into it. So just because we don't have the role doesn't mean we can't be great systems thinkers and great systems people. Um, but sometimes we need the, the horsepower of the organization and some formality. And one of the reasons we wrote the story the way we did is let's go solve problems. Let's solve problems one at a time explicitly with a systems engineer and create that business case before we start trying to sell an entire department investment. Um, so even in a big organization, business cases are appreciated. So that would be my answer. John, what would you, what else would you say or what would you augment? It's a great question. Um, what I would augment is two things. One, titles can come and go. So even if your organization doesn't have a systems engineer title, I wouldn't get hung up on that. Um, Janine's a great systems engineer and she hasn't had many roles with, with that title. Uh, but what needs to happen is those systems engineering activities. And so especially for software organizations, I like to refer them to an IEEE standard. It's IEEE standard 15288. 
and that is systems and software engineering lifecycle processes. So it's got systems engineering and software engineering in the title. Um, within that standard, there's four process groups. Um, they're all important, but I would focus on the last one, which are the technical processes. There's 14 technical processes. So um, whether somebody has the title of systems engineer on the team or nobody has that title, you're not going to collectively be successful unless each of those 14 processes are addressed. So I would take a look at that. Once again, it's IEEE standard 15288. And there, there's also a systems engineering body of knowledge. It's wiki based that um, and it will point you to that that IEEE standard as well. Uh, but it, it provides a lot of other good, good references. Yeah. Well, that leads us into audience question number three, pretty much directly um, asking, is there a competency framework or systems engineering standard and certification? And I, I, I know there is. So go ahead. Go ahead and tell them all about it. Yeah, and COSI does have certifications, um, and we, we talked about 15288 and the CBOC, S-E-B-O-K, the CBOC wiki. Uh, John, what else would you add? Um, uh, so a line to that is the NCOSI Systems Engineering Handbook, which is based on the same yes. IEEE standard, but it expands on that. So there, there's great parallels between the two. Um, they don't contradict, and if you are interested in the, the certification, so there's a systems engineering professional certification out of Incozy that is based on the systems engineering handbook. I believe the latest version is version five that got released last year. Yeah, and depending on where you are in the industry, I know if you're in DOD or Air Force, there are master's degrees that you can get from DAU in particular, or AFIT in systems engineering. So there is um, you know, there's a there's a many different ways to increase your knowledge in this area and to uh, and if you need to, to, you know, get certifications for it as well. Um, all right. Yeah, so, thank, so, thanks for saying ahead. about the master's degree. Also, let me let me elaborate on that sure. for a minute. Um, so Stevens Institute is a very popular place to get your systems engineering formal education. I actually got my master's degree at Rochester Institute of Technology. It's one of the other schools. There are a few others that offer systems engineering programs, um, but it's really important to unpack the nature of the program. And so while we were building out this story, I even commented to John and one of our other working group members, um, Tom Haggerty, he's from Eaton, that, you know, help me out with some of his deeply technical uh, aspects of the story, because in my training, like my training was operations research, software, and applied statistics, um, because it suited the industries of Rochester, which sponsored the creation of the, of the program that I took. So there are a lot of specialties in systems engineering, and I, I'm guessing if, you, if you're inclined to be interested in systems, you can probably find a specialty that suits your personal interests and the industry that you work in. Fair enough. Um, one other question that came to my mind as I was listening to this is uh, systems engineering. We we talk about it as though it's a single system, but you, you brought this up uh, later in the discussion that we're really in many cases talking about systems of systems or ecosystems, right, that in include multiple systems. And what are some of the, the special things that systems engineers can contribute to operating in those systems of systems environments. And Janine, I know that's a, I don't know John as well, but I know it's a particular area of Janine. So I'll start with you, Janine, on that one. Yeah. Um, so when you say like, what are, what are things we can contribute? So tell me a little more what you're um, hoping for example, to hear. One of, the, one of the things that I've experienced is systems engineers, when they look at things from a system of systems viewpoint, it's not just about identifying the interfaces, but it's also about identifying like the stakeholder map, identifying, um, you know, the who, not just the what in terms of the products. And, and to me, that has always been something that um, systems engineers you know, raise their hand and say, well, wait a minute, what about this stakeholder or that stakeholder? Um, you know, how, do, how are those, they going to play into the decision making in the governance, um, in the technical decisions that are made across these multiple systems. Yeah, no, thank you for that elaboration. Um, so for me, I, like I'm a diagrammer. Um, 
digital whiteboard, physical whiteboard, doesn't matter to me. I start drawing pictures. And so, you know, as a systems thinker, I know things break at the interfaces. So that's the interface part of this. But a lot of what I hone into, um, in addition to the, you know, who are all the stakeholders? What are all the parts and pieces of this system? How big is this system? Where are the boundaries? So we get we get really good at drawing, you know, how, what are all the big parts and small parts of the system? But also, where are the boundaries of what we're working with? What do we care about? Um, as an individual, I also look a lot at flow, data flow, information flow, everything flow. How does the work flow? How does the product usage flow? How does the end user use of the product? You know, what's their workflow? So as an in, as a in, as an individual systems engineer, I tend to look very very much at flow and the effect of time on the the system. Um, so that's a big thing for me and drawing pictures. I just I do it. My pictures can be very messy. So I'd say about 10% of my pictures persist. A lot of them are throwaway just to simply understand and exp like express and understand for myself and for my colleagues, like here's what's really going on. Um, and I find that even when I work with non-systems people, like I, I work with a lot of clinical people who, you know, they don't do these kind oh. of diagrams. But I show them the picture. Like if I draw it, I've worked with nurses who go, oh, yeah, no, that's not right. You're like, fix that, fix that, fix that. So they don't have to draw the picture, but if I draw it for them, it really helps them visualize their system and they, they can usually uh, participate and contribute. Um, so that's my answer to your question. I'm John, your turn. So I, I love your three C's from earlier. So uh, collaborate, communicate, and conflict resolution. Th those are essential skills within that system of systems world. Um, I like diagramming. I do a lot like uh, Janine. Um, I'm partial to the physical whiteboard, but I still do the diagramming. But the one other diagramming technique I would add to that, especially in the systems of systems world where it's, it's a lot of um, informal relationships is an influence mm -hmm. diagram. So figuring ah, out yes. who influences whom. And then sometimes you figure out somebody who doesn't have an important title is actually super influential in your total ecosystem. Yes, the uh, the the unseen power behind the throne is is one of the things that uh, system of systems is is known for leaving out if if, if there isn't someone to to do that kind of of collaboration. Um, so you mentioned uh, the idea of a causal loop diagram, and I know we we've got a little bit of extra time, so not to make you go through the whole thing, but just to for people that don't understand what that diagram is and what it produces and what it gives people. Why don't you just give us a, a, a five minutes on what is a causal loop diagram and why do systems engineers use them um, as a way of understanding systems? Yeah, sure. Um, so causal loop, so, so it really gets the idea of correlation versus causation. So we know a lot of things in the world are correlated, um, you know, B goes up when A goes up, but not necessarily related in a causal fashion. So A doesn't cause B to go up. So a causal loop diagram is really focused on looking at the causal loop diagram. So when one thing increases, it causes the other thing to increase or decrease. And we look at the chain of events. Um, so A goes up, causes B to go up, causes C to go up. And then when C goes up, does it have an impact on A? And then we create a loop. And by looking at what goes up together, what goes down together, or what goes, when one goes up, the other goes down, we can create reinforcing loops where we spiral things up to the good or actually the opposite when we spiral down. And by creating these chains of causal relationships, we can actually look for leverage in the system. So it's really taking the idea of root cause, which is very linear. Um, I've, I, I really, I'm not a fishbone diagram person because it doesn't have the loop-de-loop -loop effect. But take, take this idea of linear traceability to a root cause, put it in an ongoing loop to look for what, what's reinforcing, and then you find your leverage point. And you get all the way back to, here's the control knob. Here's the point where if we make a small change, we actually have a big difference in the end. Um, and that's pivotal to how systems engineers think. 
Um, there's great diagramming tools out there. There's one called Kumu, K-U-M-U. -U. And I have watched masterful facilitators from the systems world take people from all over the globe who, who know nothing about systems thinking or systems engineering and just engage them. Like, you know, what happens when, uh, when prices go up? Um, John, you, you called one out earlier. You started talking about a causal loop. So, but what happened, let's talk about supply chain over the last few years. What happens when, you know, avian flu hits the, the chicken, the poultry industry. And now we have a short supply of, of poultry and the supermarkets and then prices go up and then people change what they eat and on and on and on. Um, there are numerous examples from the pandemic. So causal loop diagrams allow us to look at this. And when you get really thorough with them, you can actually turn them into simulations. And this is the kind of thinking that's behind digital twins. Um, so if you nice. think about machine learning and data analytics, you know, machine learning is the automation of applied statistics. That's my little cheat sheet on machine learning. And behind the scenes of digital twins and simulations is this kind of thinking. You, you can't build good simulations on correlations. You got to build them on causation. So that's okay. my soapbox on that. Uh, John, what would you add? When people dive into that and they're, they're doing those, they're going to notice certain patterns. So um, there's a good book, Fifth Dis Dif ah, I can't speak today. Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. Um, mm -hmm. So in his book, towards the end, there's eight archetypes. And so they, the book shows you how to draw causal loop diagrams, but it also shows you how to recognize these recurring systems. These are themes that happen over and over again. Um, I saw a book once about movies, and it, it broke down like every movie that was ever produced into... I think it was seven different uh, themes. So everyone, you know, there was a, a hero and he, he goes off on a journey or a hero wins the girl. Um, so there, there's seven different movies if you were able to generalize them enough. So similar with these causal loops, you can generalize them. And when you do that, you recognize patterns. And as Janine says, when you're looking for leverage points, so some of them are spir spiraling up, spiraling down, balancing each other. Um, so you can adjust things to make it the whole system behave the way you want it to. So that, that's another fun thing you can do with causal loop analysis. All right. And that actually very, thank you. That was a very good impromptu. I know I didn't prepare you for talking about that um, mm -hmm. discussion of, the, of causal loops. I, I know that I find them to be um, sometimes disturbingly accurate in explaining why things are happening. And uh, and that's another, I, I, one of the reasons I brought it up is if you have a, um, a penchant for that kind of thinking, then you're probably on your way to being a systems engineer, whether you have the title or not. So um, listen, I wanna thank both of you for giving us your time and your thoughts today. Um, I wanna thank the working group for sponsoring this kind of uh, research. Uh, because I, I think that, uh, you know, talking about the way things work in our worlds is one of the things that we we need to, to look at on a regular basis. And the way that the world changes, depending on, you know, how we see things, if we see things from just our little view of the world, or if we start looking in a broader sense to what is what is going on beyond our world. Um, are, are very important. So I do encourage people that have interest in this to engage with the, the uh, working group and uh, help us move this kind of work forward. Uh, in terms of the webinar series itself, I also want to announce that our next webcast for the SEI series will be January 24th of this year. And the topic will be the future of software engineering and acquisition with generative AI. So this gets back to the chat GPT and all that kind of stuff that's on everybody's minds and tongues. Um, registration information for that is available on our website now, the SEI website, and will also be emailed out to people that are on our distribution list. So if you're interested in uh, generative AI, then that, that would be a, a topic for you to uh, engage with. And any questions from today's event, uh, if we didn't answer them already, if something comes up afterwards, please send those to info at sei.cmu.edu and we'll make sure that we get those to our guest speakers so that they can answer them for you. 
And with that, I'm going to say thank you, Janine. Thank you, John. It's been really fun to be engaged in this work with you. And um, at this point, I'll say thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.